can I welcome you to a snowy scene and this week's Sunday supplement. I hope by the time you're watching this, the snow will have lifted and we can all say farewell to January and look forward to February. If you happen to be new or visiting us for the very first time, can I extend a special warm welcome to you? The Downing family will now lead our time of worship in song. <laughs> Today's reading is from Genesis 25, verses 19 to 34, uh, Jacob and Esau. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram, the sister of Leban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the elder will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew, I am famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, First sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Hello, church family. I'm just wondering how you're all doing. We're finding things a little bit tough at the moment in lockdown and so I just wanted to start by giving you three words of encouragement that I felt God talked to me 
and maybe it will bless you too. The first, I felt God remind me that he is in control. And whenever I think about that, I really get a sense of peace. The second thing that I'm trying to do this year is to live one day at a time and not think too far ahead, not even really think about tomorrow. And then the final thing is I just felt God say, you are enough. And God is enough for us and he believes that we are enough. So whatever circumstances you're in, whether you're homeschooling, working or furloughed, God says you are enough. So now I'm going to get into the passage looking at the story of Isaac and Rebecca having two twins, Jacob and Esau. Now Isaac and Rebecca were fairly old by this point. It says that Isaac was 60 years old and they had wanted a family and finally God blesses them with twins. But there are some prophecies that talk about the fact that this might not be quite so straightforward. But Isaac and Rebecca take a slightly different path and decide that they prefer one twin over the other. In verse 27, it tells us a little bit about Esau and what he likes. It says that he prefers hunting and going outdoors. And it says that Jacob prefers a quiet temperament, staying at home. And so Isaac takes a preference, it tells us in verse 28, over Esau. And I believe that's because he connected with him because those are the type of things that Isaac liked doing. And Rebecca connects with Jacob because he does the things that she likes doing. But what we end up seeing is a divide. And they end up creating two teams and not working together. And this picture from the book um, of all the talks from this year that Izzy Carr so amazingly drew shows this divide very, very clearly of two different sides and two teams. And I just wonder what Isaac and Rebecca might have done to sort of help their family life. Parental favouritism destroys family life. What we learn later on in this chapter is that Jacob deceives Esau and Esau gives him his birthright over a bowl of stew. And later on, Jacob steals the blessing from his father. And these two boys end up at war and they hate one another. Their family life is completely destroyed. There are two separate camps and they don't come together. And as parents, sometimes we do connect perhaps with one child more than the other. And I wonder whether Isaac and Rebecca could have decided to all go out on a hunt together and then come back and cook together what they made just to help bring the two sides together. And that's what we can do in our own families. If we do connect more with one child than the other, sometimes it's trying to get down and, and enjoy what they enjoy. I um, find playing cars with my little boy very difficult, but nonetheless, I know he really values it when he does that. And likewise with my little girl, if he ever gets to paint, she ever gets to paint, Rob's nails. She's absolutely thrilled with that. So part of it is enjoying each other's things even though it might not be what we particularly enjoy and enjoying family time together. What does God think about favouritism? Well it says in Deuteronomy 10 verse 17, he is the great God, the mighty and awesome God who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. God doesn't show favouritism. If he did, I wouldn't be in the kingdom of God because I'm just a nobody, nothing special. But God chooses anybody to come into his kingdom of God. And that shows that he does not like favouritism. And then in the New Testament, in James chapter 2, verse 1, 
It says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious God, the Lord Jesus Christ, if you favour some people over others? He's saying, don't do it. Don't favour people. So how do we do that and apply that to our lives today? Well, we have our family lives, but we also have our church family. And I refer to you as church family at the start. And it's important that we don't have favourites in the church, that we don't form cliques. Because when new people come in and they don't fit in or they don't enjoy the same things that we enjoy, they'll leave again. So it's important that we trust in Jesus and we treat everyone the same because that's what Jesus did. He treated everybody the same, whether they're a tax collector, a Pharisee or the woman by the well. Everyone was treated the same and that's how God wants us to treat others. And that works at work and that works in our friendships as well. So a question to think about in our own lives Am I showing favouritism in any area of my life? What could I do this week in my family, in my work or with my friendships? It might be giving someone a call that we wouldn't normally call. It might be at work giving someone an opportunity that we don't normally allow to do so much things. Or it might be in our family having a good family game together and enjoying everybody's different likes and dislikes. And also we may have experienced people having favourites over us and sometimes we need to learn to forgive those people and realise that you are enough. God has chosen you and he doesn't have favourites, so neither should we. Father God, forgive us, for all too often we live carelessly, having little thought for you or for others. We speak without thinking, act with little thought of the consequences, and then wonder why our mistakes return to haunt us. Instead of joy, we bring sorrow, Instead of harmony, discord. Instead of help, hindrance. Instead of encouragement, dismay. Teach us that we reap what we sow, for good or ill. And so in everything we do, help us to be more caring, more considerate, more supportive, more wise. So that a harvest of our lives may be pleasing to you. Hi, um, I've been asked just to say what life's like at the moment with being on furlough and um, I thought it would be a good time to film at night when all the children are in bed and it's quiet but actually the reality is that being on furlough is actually that everyone is here all the time um, unless they're at school on the couple of days that they're um, getting school provision at the moment. So on a Friday normally I would be at Little Ones with Sarah and Heather welcoming mums and dads and carers and children into the church hall and um, enjoying getting to know new people and um, providing a space for people to have um, a sense of community um, within our village. Currently um, furlough Friday for me looks a bit like this where we've done a bit of homeschooling this morning we've had a few Webex calls with different classes for the boys and um, we've attempted very poorly to do two activities one of our kids has done a little bit of PE um, and at the moment everyone's building a marble run with Nico in the playroom and squabbling over how many marbles they each get to put down the chute um, so Friday looks like that in our house. Um, it's called Fun Friday at school and it's very chaotic, but this is, this is what Friday looks like for us and for me at the moment. Um, all our children are at home on a Friday um, and the boys have some school provision during the week on other days. Um, but yeah, so this is us. I'm missing seeing everybody frequently at, at um, the church. Um, but I know that this is where we need to be at home and with our children and helping them to still reach their potential as best we can. You're like a targeted strike.
Thank you for being with us. It's always a delight to see you. Please do join us again next Sunday when we'll be taking a break from our sermon series to look at how the Israelites gave so generously to the fabrication of the tabernacle, which was their portable sanctuary as they wandered in the desert for 40 years.